And there you go. One of the pictures we haven't been able to show you. This is a little up-close shot. You see it right there from uh, up where the uh, uh, astronauts are going to be. And you see it starting to pull away now, which means we'll be able to see a whole lot of the uh, activity going on there. We, we did just moments ago, by the way, see as the astronauts were actually going into the area where they're going to be. In fact, we were talking about how incredibly confined it looked mm -hmm. as they were trying to get into that area to see if they can uh, get that shot. This is a very important shuttle. It's a, it's a trip that's going to uh, take this uh, shuttle into the area where the uh, International Space Station is. You know, International Space Station scheduled to retire in 2010. You heard uh, one of the uh, flight specialists say, well, we're really up there going to take some furniture. Actually, mm -hmm. they're going to be doing a, a little bit more than that. It's a little more technical be, than that, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is, as a matter of fact. They're, they're going to be doing something that's very important. And, and most important, I suppose, is for people who watch the shuttle program is to get another shuttle launch off safely and effectively, which seems to be like what they're yeah, trying to do. Yeah, and safety is the key word here. We've been watching, and as you know, this has been delayed uh, for quite some time due to some technical difficulties, also due to the weather outside. Today, the weather looks like it is going to cooperate. And looking at that clock right now, we're just uh, five minutes away from liftoff. Let's bring in now CNN's Daniel Seberg at the site there in Florida to talk about today's uh, shuttle mission and what it means and the importance of this, Daniel. Uh, quite a sight to see, but uh, more importantly, they've got a job to do. They certainly do. Uh, yeah, good morning, Betty. Uh, the weather here is cooperating so far. We are looking at a green condition or a go for launch. And at this point, I want to uh, bring in Miles O'Brien, anchor from uh, CNN's American Morning, as well as uh, our space and aviation guru. Uh, Miles, if you were a betting man, are we uh, looking to go this morning? Well, you know, you never bet on these things because <laughs> there's all, with a million parts all uh, done by the lowest bidder, there's a lot of things that can go wrong between here and there. But look, take a look at that beautiful picture there. A picture-perfect day. The wind just uh, barely wisping. You can see at the top the liquid oxygen gas spilling off of the, that uh, gaseous oxygen vent hood. And then, whoa, that was a NASA camera there. We apologize for that. And then at the bottom, the liquid, uh, the gaseous hydrogen venting out, barely moving a bit. There you can see probably some uh, close-up pictures there of the uh, shuttle on the launch pad. This is the first uh, construction mission to the International Space Station since we lost Columbia in February 2003. This crew uh, has an incredibly difficult task ahead of them. At the helm yeah, let's is talk the about the crew. Yeah, at the helm yeah, is... Absolutely, let's, let's introduce them. Commander Brent Jett is at the helm, and it's interesting. The last time he flew, he flew SDS-97 back in December of 2000 and did a very similar mission uh, to, on board Space Shuttle Endeavour where they delivered a solar array and truss to the International Space Station, which is what is going on precisely in this mission. This is his fourth flight, first in his class at Annapolis. This guy is, uh, you know, the, the right stuff kind of guy. Yeah, and from, a, from a veteran to, uh, to a rookie, uh, with the uh, pilot who's sitting to his right, that would be uh, Chris Ferguson. Uh, an interesting little tidbit about uh, Chris Ferguson, he is... Uh, he is a drummer uh, in a rock and roll band called Max Q, and I think he was hoping to bring up some drumsticks on board, but was unable to. <laughs> um, but he is the pilot on this mission. It is his first time up there. Uh, he'll be working the uh, right side of the uh, shuttle uh, on their way up. All right, we got about three minutes to launch now. Max Q, of course, refers to the moment during liftoff when the, the orbiter encounters its highest aerodynamic pressure. So a little astronaut joke there. Joe Tanner is a veteran. This is his fourth flight. Last flew with uh, Brent Jett as commander on STS-97 to that space station mission. Has a lot of experience as a spacewalker. Was on uh, one of the uh, Hubble repair missions, conducted a couple of uh, spacewalks there. Married with a couple of kids and uh, a true veteran in this uh, mission. Yeah, affectionately known as Papa, I think, by uh, the crew. He's uh, age uh, 56. There's also a woman going up on this uh, flight. She will be the uh, sixth U.S. woman to perform a spacewalk, uh, Heidi Stephanie Piper. Uh, she uh, talked about having a, a teenage son who thinks that's pretty cool that mom's going up. She is a rookie. This is her first mission. She's also a diver, so that, she has said, is uh, going to help her with some of these uh, rather complex uh, spacewalks. And she's uh, got two of them planned uh, with Joe Tanner. Her parents immigrated from the Ukraine and Germany to the United States. Dan Burbank is also on this mission. Dan Burbank is the only member of the United States Coast Guard ever to fly in space. Went to the Coast Guard Academy, and we're about two minutes away from launch. He's logged over 3,500 hours flying Coast Guard rescue helicopters, including a rescue mission in the famous Perfect Storm, which was memorialized in a book and movie. 
and uh, 300 search and rescue missions. He flew on STS-106, that was also aboard Atlantis back in September of 2000. That was also a mission to the space station. And I'm gonna let you do the Canadian, uh, Daniel, because yeah, I know that's full, important to you. Right, full disclosure, I am Canadian and all of Canada will be watching with Steve McLean. Uh, he will actually be the first Canadian astronaut to use the uh, Canada arm or the robotic arm that's part of the shuttle and part of the uh, International Space Station. He has been up once before. He's affectionately known as the uh, professor. Uh, sort of a quiet guy, but uh, very smart guy, and uh, all of Canada will be watching him as we go up. And Miles, as you pointed out, we're getting very close here, about a minute or so left. At this point, you figure the astronauts actually think this is going to happen. What's sort of going through their mind right now? Well, you know, they are constantly going through a checklist right now, and it's, it's, it's a moment-by-moment moment thing. I've talked to many astronauts who say the closer you get to launch, the more you live, not just in the moment, but in the second. And what they're doing right now uh, is probably getting a few butterflies as you would before you go out on, on a stage, if you will. But uh, at this point, and it's checklist and, and going and remembering the astronaut creer, creed and prayer. Dear Lord, please don't let me be the one to screw up. Right. And now the onboard computers have, or the control has been switched over to the shuttle at this point, Miles. Uh, yes, and that is exactly at this moment right now. Just happened. Yeah, this is computers now control. Okay. So we're getting close now at about. Uh, T minus uh, six and a half seconds or so, uh, the main engines will start at this point. The crew has closed the visors on their helmets. They are strapped in. They are preparing to go. Let's listen in now to the uh, Kennedy Space Center commentator, George Diller, as he counts down the uh, final few seconds before launch. Seven, six, five, three main engines up and burning. Two, one, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis, opening a new chapter in the completion of the International Space Station for the collaboration of nations in space. Roger, low, Atlantis. Houston is now controlling. The roll maneuver is underway. Atlantis is heading into a heads down position on course for a 51.6 degree, 137 by 36 statute mile orbit. already two miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center at an altitude of 2.8 statute miles. Engines now at 72% beginning to throttle back up as the vehicle passes through the area of maximum dynamic pressure. Atlantis Houston, go at throttle up. Copy. Go All three liquid-fueled engines are back at full throttle. One minute, 20 seconds into the flight. At liftoff, the fully-fueled shuttle, boosters and external tank weighed about four and a half million pounds. It now has burned half of that weight in propellant. Solid. Solid rocket boosters are burning 11,000 pounds of propellant every second. We're just second. about uh, 15 seconds away from the separation of the solid rocket boosters, a very critical seconds. point here in the uh, launch. Standing by for first stage, uh, it, it is a critical point, uh, Daniel, because up until this point, there is really no um, possibility of any sort of um, evasive or return capability for the crew. Once those solid rocket boosters come off at two, two minutes, five seconds, right now, there you go, watch them go off. Uh, everybody breathes a sigh of relief. Separation a lot of things can still confirmed. happen, but the ride gets smoother and the options All for the crew, if something goes wrong, uh, increase dramatically. As as and those two solid rocket boosters continue upwards for uh, some period of time. They will actually be recovered uh, off the coast of uh, Florida here when they actually return to the ocean. They have a satellite tracking system to retrieve them. Miles, what's happening to the crew right at this point? Because obviously it's a very intense ride, uh, some forces at work on their bodies. Um, are they just sort of hanging on at this point? Yeah, what's happening now is that they call this portion of the ascent uh, the electric ride, if you will. It goes from bone rattling, filling jarring ride on those solid rocket boosters, which just shake you around, around like crazy, uh, through the atmosphere. And now they're up so high, here they are at 48 miles in altitude. Things get very smooth and much quieter all of a sudden. And what happens from now on is they have a, a, a steadily increasing amount of G-forces on them, up to a maximum of about three Gs. 
three times your weight here on the planet Earth. So that is, I'm trying to listen to that call right now, but that's what's happening right now. Steady pressure on them right now. Right, so the uh, clock is now counting up towards about eight and a half minutes when they will get uh, into orbit, break through uh, the Earth's atmosphere. That is a very critical point. Uh, Miles, if like the first two minutes or the first two inches is the toughest part in terms of the preparation, just getting off the ground, this first eight and a half minutes is essential in terms of safety and risk because of, as we've been hearing for so long, the potential for foam to come off or debris and hit the orbiter itself, as we of course learned after Columbia in 2003. Yeah, I've been looking at these pictures as closely as I can, Daniel, and these pictures are, are wonderful for us to experience this, but they really are there Atlanta for the engineers. Houston, negative return. All right, negative return, that's an important thing. That's an, As they gain altitude and speed Atlanta and, and no return continue this ride into now, space, negative return is the point at which they will not be coming back to the Kennedy Space Center under any circumstances in the event of some kind of emergency. All right, there's something wrong with... Alpha to off, back to GPC. Okay, we'll cycle test A off, then back to GPC. All right, they're working something in the... In the in the, uh, something to do with the flash evaporator that to, system. Uh, and that to cycle the flash evaporator system. Again, all auxiliary power units uh, still working fine, as are the electricity producing fuel cells. Four minutes, 45 seconds into the launch. Atlantis is at an altitude of 65 statute miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, 225 miles, traveling 7,000 miles per hour. Now those auxiliary power units, as you know, Daniel, are the uh, electrical source which power the aero surfaces of the space shuttle and during launch and landing are critical for uh, providing on the flight ele loop, uh, electricity. The flash evaporator system, the suspect, uh, a little bit of water in that unit, uh, but all continues to work. Uh, hey, Daniel, this is Betty. Water. Let me ask you this while we're waiting and we're watching. Uh, you guys have been talking about this flash evaporator. What exactly is that for those of us who don't know NASA speak? Atlanta, Houston. I'm sorry, say that again, Betty. There's a helicopter landing just oh, right behind you. Oh, okay. Well, I was Did asking you about the flash evaporator. I know there's been some talk just recently. You and Miles were discussing that as we were listening to NASA on the ground talk about the system there. Uh, what exactly is that uh, for those of us who are unfamiliar with a flash evaporator? Well, I'm actually going to turn that over to Miles because I'm sorry, I just cannot hear you. The helicopter is literally right behind us here. Miles, I'm sure you know, you're very familiar with uh, NASA speak and, and all the equipment and technology that they use. The flash evaporator, what is that? The flash evaporator is part of the auxiliary power unit system. It's how that system discharges uh, heat. And it, the auxiliary power units are a crucial thing. They're run by hydrazine, uh, which is a toxic substance in and of its own right. There are, there are multiple auxiliary power units. But, but what... What we're hearing from Kyle Herring, and I'm hesitating just listening to Kyle Herring, who is uh, in Houston, uh, giving us a sense Atlanta, of this. Houston, press to Miko, and we're seeing good cooling on Fast Pry Alpha. Okay, there we go. That, so, that's yeah. what you want to hear right now. They're telling them to go to main engine cutoff. That means that they're not telling them to do any sort of abort maneuver. And what they're saying is that this flash evaporator, which provides cooling for these auxiliary power units, which heat up hydrazine, which is a toxic chemical, essentially. It's very hot. And it needs to be, that heat needs to be discharged somehow. Apparently there was something with that, wrong with that flash evaporator or some indication. And it's that uh, Miko or main engine cutoff point that's a little over a minute from now, about a minute and 20 seconds from now, and you will see that orange external fuel tank begin to uh, fall away and burn up as it falls through uh, the Earth's atmosphere. So you kind of left us hanging there a little bit, uh, guys. Is, is everything okay with the flash evaporator right. as far yeah. as we can tell? Or yeah, I'm sorry. Or are they having some questions about it? I'm, I'm trying to, you know, trying to listen in on the radio calls while I'm talking, and it's kind of difficult, Rick. I apologize. No, that's yes, fine. I think I think what happened was what they've determined is they got some sort of uh, errant uh, indication from it. There might have been a piece of ice or something that got caught on this flash evaporator system, which there's a freon loop which cools this these uh, systems, mm -hmm. and somehow that might have caused some sort of problem in there. I, I, uh, left but the, the key we want to impart to you and our viewers is that uh, obviously everything is all right here. They have made their, they're already uh, very close to main engine cutoff. They're go for major engine cutoff and go for orbit.